Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome. I want to thank you all so much for being with us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mahasan Chaney. I'm the Assistant Professor of Education here at Brown. Um, and as part of our programming committee, I want to welcome you all to our first talk of the year and say a little bit more about the goals that we have in building up our programming offerings. Um, so this year we really want to consider and explore what we're calling uh, critical research on race and racism in education. Um, in some ways we are approaching this series of talks to consider critical theory or theories as schools of thought that stress the examination and the critique of society and culture. Um, this series of talks asks how we consider theories and methods um, and how we can use critical theories and methods to push against traditional boundaries of social science and educational scholarship more broadly. Um, in doing so, critical in this context centers questions of race and racism in examining impacts of reforms and policies. It examines questions of broader cultural and political economy, and it considers power. And through these questions, we're hopeful that these talks might give us a way to uh, also reflect upon our own practice as researchers and educators. Um, this series of talks are also critical in the sense that they offer theoretical insights into timely discussions about the current politics of education. Um, um, and said differently, we hope to engage with, understand, and challenge contemporary debates about the inclusion and excisions of race from school curriculums. So how do we, for example, frame political contestations of, and mischaracterizations of critical race theory um, how do we consider or think about, uh, for instance, this new call to challenge woke math or woke science or woke history or wokeness? Um, so given the continued attack on racially inclusive curriculum, we see this as an optimal time to consider how other critical theories and methodological insights might inform contemporary practice, policy, politics, and redirect uh, our focus of research in education. Um, so before getting to the primary reason of why we're here this afternoon, I just want to do a few more plugs about some of the uh, programs we have planned for you all this year. Um, so related to this series are a few talks that we see uh, as being in strong conversation with the ones hosted by education. So on February 16th, um, and in almost a seamless flow from today's talk, the Annenberg Institute here at Brown will host Otis Johnson, a uh, blooming bird distinguished professor at John Hopkins University who will continue this conversation that we're again starting here today about how to think about critical quantitative methods. Um, later in February, Victor Ray, author on, of On Critical Race Theory, applies critical race theory to classic sociological questions, um, and that's scheduled for February 23rd. Um, and next in March, our series continues again in sponsorship with the Annenberg Institute with a talk from Kiana Ross, who is an assistant professor of African American Studies at Northwestern University, uh, who will be giving a talk on anti-blackness, black crit, and what she sees as critical ethnography. So together, these talks capture how we think through and employ theory from various, various methodological and disciplinary backgrounds. Um, in ways that can be critical interventions for framing uh, and researching schools, but also thinking about theory and method together. Um, and lastly, we're also planning to consider other critical questions related to affirmative action, uh, particularly as these questions come up in the Supreme Court. So we hope to invite experts on higher education, race, and policy from Brown uh, to sit on a panel to think about these questions from, again, multiple perspectives. So we hope that you will join us for those talks and uh, look out for announcements uh, as the semester continues. Okay, now, to kick us off this semester um, and this afternoon, we will be hearing from Professor Ezekiel Dixon-Roman, uh, who will help us frame questions of method and theory by considering how critical theory is in dialogue with quantification. Um, this talk will lay some of the philosophical and theoretical backgrounds and challenges to quantification um, and we'll consider why they matter and, and also why they matter, especially for theorizing and considering blackness. Um, so by way of introduction, I will say that I first met Professor Dixon Roman in 2011 while he was a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. I had just completed a master's program at UPenn and was getting ready to reapply to PhD school. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, and so um, I, I went to actually what was then my first talk of like as a, as a pre-doctoral 
student. Um, and his talk, Inheriting Impossibility, the Social Distribution of Possibilities of Youth Culture, both excited and frightened me as a prospective graduate student. Um, I was excited for the range of questions one might include in educational-related research. Um, Professor Dixon Ramon considers research um, and rethinks the reconceptualizations, the technologies of quantification from a critical theoretical lens. Um, and he's particularly interested in how power and inequality are reproduced, especially in human learning and development. Um, this was also a very interesting uh, talk to me because it was the first time I'd ever seen a clip of The Wire, and also the first time I'd seen that you can include things like that in academic talks. Um, so I was also a little bit nervous because, um, and, and I might still not quite understand, but this talk may illuminate, how we understand um, how um, he defines this concept of socio-technical socio systems of quantification. Um, and so thinking through, like, what do all of these big theories mean? So you can imagine as a, as a pre-dissertation doctoral student, I was like, how do, I'm both excited and a little nervous. Um, but since then, I can list a series of accomplishments, written works, and accolades, uh, which I will do now. Um, so, Professor Dixon Ramon received his Doctor of Philosophy and Psychometrics from Fordham University. He is currently Associate Professor of Social Policy at the University of Pennsylvania. There he serves as the Director of the Masters in Science and Social Policy Program. He is the Founder and Chair of the Data Analytics for Policy Certificate Program. He is also a, a faculty associate for the Center for African, Africana Studies, and he also holds secondary appointments in a number of departments and schools, including the Graduate School of Education, the Department of Africana Studies, the Annenberg School for Communication, and he also is a faculty affiliation with Latin American and Latino Studies Program, Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Program, and the Warren Center for Network and Data Sciences. So these, uh, as you all might uh, um, see, attest to the multidisciplinary range of his research. Um, this and Ramon is also the author of the book Inheriting Possibility, Social Reproduction and Quantification in Education, which was published at the University of Minnesota Press and was also the winner of the 2018 American Educational Research Association Outstanding Book Award. He also co-edited Thinking Comprehensively About Education, Spaces of Educative Possibility and Their Implications for Public Policy. And he's also contributed to and edited a number of special issues and published articles in journals, including Communication in the Public, Educational Measurement, Issues in Practice, um, Reading Research Quarterly, Equity and Excellence in Education, um, Urban Education and Teachers College Press, just to name a few. Um, he also co-edited special issues, including the 2016 Alternative Ontologies of Number, Rethinking the Quantitative and Computational Culture, and the 2017 Computational Turn in Educational Research, Critical and Creative Perspectives on Digital and Data Deluge uh, with Research and Education. Um, so alongside these impressive range of publications, Professor Dixon Ramon has received a number of prestigious grants, honors, and awards, including the 2020-2022 William Tree Grant Foundation's President's Special Initiative Grant, the Spencer Foundation Learning Institute Grant, and the National Science Foundation Collaborative Training Grant for his work with the Institute in Advanced Critical, Quantitative, and Computational Methodologies. Um, his current book projects include a handbook for critical inquiry and quantitative methods, an edited collection of scholarship and philosoph that philosophically rethinks the possibilities of quantitative methods for critical inquiry, and he's also working on an authored book project that theoretically empirically examines the ways in which data and algorithms become racialized forces, particularly in the area of algorithmic governance. Um, so, uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Jason Ramon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm always a bit uh, taken by the beautiful introductions, um, but also, um, I'm, I'm even more nervous from them as well, but thank you. Um, and it's, it's also, I, I have to say, it's a, it's a pleasure and absolute excitement to see you here this day in this space, right? So when I, when I first met her, as you mentioned, um, it was while I was a visiting scholar at Berkeley prior to even entering the PhD, and now to see you here today is, is absolute pleasure and awesome. <laughs> um, 
So, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to begin by extending my appreciation, of course, to Mahasan Cheney for her thoughtful and gracious introduction. I'd also like to thank the Brown University Department of Education for inviting me to share my work with you all today. Um, this afternoon, I'd like to discuss several of the challenges that critical philosophy and theory have leveled in relation to quantification. So part of what, I wanna, what I'm gonna do is speak in between, if you will, um, my previous work and drawing connections to my current work, um, and more so really to try to cultivate a conversation around even this discourse around critical theory in relationship to the use of quantification or quantitative methods. Um, these are some of the wrestles that were in the backdrop to my book, Inheriting Possibility, but also some of which that I continue to work through today, especially in relation to computational cultures. Thus, I will focus my discussion on some of the history of philosophy and critical theory and their various critiques of what Horkheimer and Adorno referred to as instrumental reason, a displacement of human reason and instrumentality such as empiricism. I explain this further below. While I will discuss Horkheimer and Adorno's critique of instrumental reason, I will also discuss the other related critiques that were not only from the Frankfurt School, but other thinkers in the broader umbrella of critical theory, including Heidegger, um, the Birmingham School, um, post-structuralism, critical race theory, black radical thought, and black feminisms, among others. My goal here is not to deconstruct quantification away, although at certain points it may seem that way, um, but to provide an intellectual lay of the land of the work that needs to be done in order to rework quantification out of the trappings of European modernity and colonial worlding. This is especially important now, as there is a growing discourse in attention to critical theory and quantification. In addition to my own work, there's work in quant crit, indigenous statistics, critical geography studies, and strategic positivism, critical quantitative methods, critical data science, and critical computation, among others. This turn has also occurred, I think, in part because of the proliferation of data due to distributed and network technologies and the, their massive exhaust of data streams, turning attention to the quantitative by critical scholars in ways that were not the case 20 or 30 years ago. Um, I, and I must add, I mean, as anyone who, and within the, the scholarship of critical theory that's interested in going after questions of power, to not go after data and technologies of, of quantification, even algorithms, in in our current contemporary moment is actually to be missing a huge important aspect of, op of the operative logics of power. While there have been significant developments in the use of quantification in relation to critical theory, I maintain that the relevant critiques of instrumental reason have not been adequately addressed in order to refer to a critical quantification or critical quantitative inquiry, where the critical is an adjective that describes what the quantitative is doing. Also of note here, I do not refer to quanti critical quantitative methods as method would be in contradiction to the interrogative work of critique or deconstruction. Thus, what I share today may be understood as the theoretical terrain necessary to traverse the limits of instrumental reason by which post-critical interventions, including that which I proffer in inheriting possibility, seek to work toward addressing. Let me see if I can work this. Hey. All right. By the way, I'm not going to have any like clips from the wire to show, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I do like to play in media studies like this, so it helps. Um, all right. So one of the victorious trajectories of the Enlightenment was reason and its institution of man, the subject, as a manufactured, transparent eye and universal subject. It was understood that reason was the sole determinant of truth and freedom and displaced the former adjudicating authority of, European Christian, of a European Christian God. Reason was initially understood to be an exclusive attribute of the mind, what Descartes called the cogito, or I think, therefore I am. This proposition separated the mind from the body, knowing from being, and culture from nature and became foundational to Western philosophy and the later theories and methodologies of the social and cultural sciences. The cogito, the thinking and all-knowing subject, was privileged with the faculties to observe and reason 
on the world from a distance, or even through a perch, through a window, as Descartes characterized. Descartes conceptualized the cogito to be based on a split between mind and body. This was necessitated because the body was understood to be part of the extended things of the world. Thus, in order for the mind or the subject to engage in pure reason without subjective influence, it had to be independent of the body. Others later recognized the relationship between the mind and body and how the mind needed the body's faculties of observation shaping a perception of the world and argue that the subject's reason is always obscured by human perception. This is in part what became understood as Kant's critique of reason, or pure reason. It is also one of the earliest articulations of social constructionism. Although Kant develops his own articulation around the perceptual limits of the body via his articulation of the transcendental subject, a, trans a, a transparent subject whose interiority is in direct relationship with the exterior things of the world and associated with time and space, or even inflected through time and space. The need to shift to instrumentalities such as science and history as well as, uh, was well recognized and underway. This shift from the mind of the modernist subject to the instruments of science, technology, and history are what Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno um, refer to as instrumental reason. For Horkheimer and Adorno, the Enlightenment advanced instrumental reason as a move of capitalism to replace or displace the reasoning of the human mind into other valued, even deified, social mechanisms and practices such as number, science, positivism, technology, or the market. While the Enlightenment aimed to dispel myths via the pursuit of truth and freedom through reason, Horkheimer and Adorno argued that because instrumental reason did not account for social and cultural historical context or its inability to capture everything of nature and as such distorting the real, instrumental reason produced more myths in place of myths. In other words, instrumental reason, especially positivism, they argued, lacked the capacity to capture the real due to the limits of instrumentalities. It's not that Horkheimer and Adorno did not believe in the promises of the Enlightenment. In fact, quite the opposite. They lamented the fact that not only were these promises not delivered by the Enlightenment and its instrumentalities, developed instrumentalities, but that the turn to instrumentality was in the interest of veiling and, and legitimating the social relations of production and extractive violence of capital accumulation. Like into Horkheimer and Adorno, Heidegger also famously shared his own concern of technology. As a way to question the essence of technology, Heidegger turns to the etymology of technology, which derives from the Greek word techne. Heidegger notes that at one time it also meant poesis, or the bringing forth of the true into the beautiful. As such, the essence of technology is supposed to enframe the universe and bring forth the truths of nature. Yet Heidegger argues that technology only offers us representations of things, not things in themselves. These representations are always limited in, in, limited in their capacity to represent the thing, or the referent, we might even say. Um, and just to even give an example, this might be data as an example. In addition to the critique of the Frankfurt School and Martin Heidegger, the, Birming the Birmingham School of Contemporary Cultural Studies had a related yet distinct critique of the epistemological limits of quantification. The Birmingham School emerges in the early 60s primarily by scholars out of literary studies that were interested in the materialist analysis of power relations, particularly through the aesthetic or cultural phenomena. Not only were these, schol these scholars not bound by disciplinary conventions, but in fact, they sought to employ sociological ethnography with the close readings of literary studies in order to analyze the materiality of power. Their transdisciplinary approach, a cultural materialism, gained widespread scholarly significance and influenced or produced work on topics such as media, schooling, moral panics and crises, and punk and subversive cultures, just to name a few. 
While cultural studies became widely recognized in the academy as a transdisciplinary field focused on the study of power and difference, it also had its methodological conventions, one of which was a hermeneutics of suspicion toward quantification. This suspicion was lodged in an understanding that quantification does two things. One, rests on logics of representationalism, and two, only focuses on the normed or averaged bodies at the cost of the marginal subject. Cultural studies sought to not represent the voice of the marginal subject, but rather center, center their voice by making them the focus of their analysis and study. As Patricia Clough discusses, the second concern led to a turn to phenomenological approaches to qualitative inquiry, which resulted in a methodological unconscious that let in the back door logical empiricism and logical positivism by treating data as self-evident. One of the very principles of logical empiricism, logical positivism, is to treat data as self-evident. It is also, which you know, I should add, rests on an all-knowing subject, rests on a transparent subject, rests on ideas of a subject that is um, fully present, fully conscious. Um, as I lose my, where I was. It is also important to note that critical race theory shared the same concern of statistical methods and methodological unconscious, in addition to an argument that the methods were lodged in white logics. Um, I will come back to this point in, um, in a little bit. Thus, for related yet distinct reasons, critical theory and cultural studies maintain a, her a hermeneutics of suspicion toward quantification and wrote it off as doing either the standardization work of capitalism, the interpolating work of ideology, or the disciplining of docile bodies via measurements, normative gaze. Yet, in addition to these critiques of reason in relation to instrumentality, scholarship in black radical thought and black radical feminism, in particular, have interrogated the associated formation of the category of the human and how this conceptualization became central to social and human sciences and liberal political philosophy. In the post-enlightenment, the German philosopher, George, yeah, I'm not gonna try to even flex my German because it's not good at all. So Hegel, the philosopher Hegel, <laughs> developed the conceptualization of the human subject that consolidated between Immanuel Kant's articulation of the transcendental and as such the universalizing of European reason with Johann Gottfried von Herder's theoretical account of difference as a product of cultural geographic difference and the production of tribalism due to prejudice. Through this consolidation, Hegel conceptualized a human subject that was based on the European universal of culture and reason, and all, and all non-European subjects being characterized as some degree of distance from this. This is what Denise Ferreira da Silva has characterized as the subject of the post-enlightenment. For De Silva, the subject for Europe was a transparent subject, what has also been characterized as the liberal subject or the all-knowing subject. In contrast, the non-European subject was an affectable subject, a subject that was endogenous to and shaped by the forces of nature. The affectable subject was not just a primitive subject, but also animalized or even constituted as an animal. As Zykeer Jackson has, has highlighted, for instance, while Europeans had heard of primates, they did not see them until their colonialist encounters in Africa. And as a result, interestingly, collapsing the people of Africa with primates. Zykeer Jackson also sharply argues that the affectable subject was not simply constituted as partially human or non-human, but rather racial capitalism has oscillated the human non-human constitution of the affectable subject through its situated and contingent ne necessities and interest. Regardless of inclusion to the category of the human, the subject of the post-enlightenment was formed based on colonial logics of raciality. When instrumental reason replaced human reason via empiricism, this inaugurated another process associated with the empirical legitimation of hierarchies difference. In fact, it was the Hegelian or post-enlightenment subject that informed many of the developments in science, technology, or, and governance. According to Ferreira da Silva, 
Hegel, Hegel introduced in the back door of the subject natural human difference into the liberal subject of modernism. This set the context for the later analytics of raciality of the sciences, that is, a comparative analysis establishing the scientific grounds for human difference. This includes the 19th century work in biology, anthropometry, craniometry, and psychophysics, and early 20th century work in psychometrics that informed the raciality of the mind, as well as the 20th century work on the sociology of space and populations of human differences that materialize in the analytics of raciality. Some of the modernist terms that undergirded the analytics of raciality were history, time, and space, as in geography. History, time, and space were important in shaping categories of difference. As Denise Ferreira da Silva argues, it is through the temporalizing of categories via Hegel's and Herder's natural history of racial categories as um, that produces sociopolitical logics of raciality. It is via Herder's account of human history as situated in varying geographical contexts where he develops his conceptualization of the emergence of the interiority of human groups via their overcome achievements. So I mean, this is literally the narrative of history and development, the ways in which the, the, Euro, um, the European Enlightenment um, uh, accounted for or, or documented the, the development of civilizations was based on um, a particular conceptualization and understanding of the developments or the achievements within society. That was the materiality of the interiorities of, of, of the developments of the human mind of these civilizations. Regarding Hegel, De Silva states that he replaces Herder's nature with open quote father spirit, a gesture that further apprehends the world as the exhibition hall of an entity that belongs in time, an interior thing. There he finds that spirit had not done its work on African minds and territories, for the Negro lacked the ideas that registered the spirit's presence." End quote. Through Herders and Hegel's move to make natural history and the spirit the causal force of development of a group's interior capacities, they cemented colonial ideas of progress and development, and as such, the manifestation of sameness and difference via what Sylvia Winter has called man one and man two, or the cosmogonies of human origin. Man one refers to the rational political subject um, developed in liberal political and political philosophy, going back to John Rawls, and later revision of humanness um, uh, and, and, and a re later revision of humanists gives rise to homo economicus, or what she calls man two, formulated within the economic model of Adam Smith and the colonial episteme of Darwinian selection, dividing the naturally selected, or Europeans, from the naturally diselected of those racialized as naturally inferior. Consequently, uh, as a significant premise in the conceptualization of the post-Enlightenment subject, Time is also profoundly important for the spectrality of colonial violence and racial subjugation. In fact, time, history, and space, as demarcated by geographic context, or more specifically development, became the necessary descriptors in the formations of sameness and difference, as well as economic conditions, um, social conditions, human capacities, and even frameworks that inform social policies and practices of governance all of which make up the system of racial capitalism and the metaphysics of blackness. The technologies of racial capitalism have been designed to identify, categorize, scale, and manage the potential threats of blackness. Practices of measurement have long been necessitated for the interest of racialism, and racialism have, has always been a form of measurement. The observation of bodies, identifying difference, categorizing difference, and hierarchical scaling of difference based on the epistemological universal of cosmogenies of man are the base axiomatics of both racialism and measurement. While today we like to think of measurement as quantification, it does not have to be. In, in its simplest form, the categorizing of phenomena is a, best, is a basic practice of measurement. It is what S.S. S. Stevens called a nominal scale. Racialism does not just include the categorization of bodies, 
but also includes the sociopolitical assumptions to those discursive formations, placing those, cate those categorized bodies on a hierarchical scaling, what Stevens named an ordinal scale. Thus, in the move to instrumental reason during the post-Enlightenment, measurement was not simply a logical extension of racialism, but, as I will delineate, racialism was a grounding concept to the development of empirical practices of measurement and was built into the axiomatics of the mathematics of measurement. Put another way, racialism is a practice of measurement. Measurement is a process of racialism. In order to more clearly elucidate my argument of racial logics built into the axiomatics of measurement, I'd like to provide three well-used and known examples in statistics and computation. Correlation, the logistic function, and differential calculus. Each of these are widely known and used statistical and mathematical models or methods for both statistical and computational approaches to measurement, two of which are methods of the statistical theories that undergird classical and modern measurement theory. And the third was one of the mathematical methods that propelled the developments in computational methods. I will discuss each in turn, tracing how the method is designed to scale for the subject of the post-Enlightenment. The Pearson correlation coefficient, coefficient is one of the earliest and most widely used statistics in the social sciences, more broadly and, and for measurement in particular. The correlation coefficient was initially invented by Sir Francis Galton in order to study his interest in heredity and the homophily of populations. Galton is one of the major thinkers of biology and statistics, the founder of psychometrics, and the one who coined eugenics. His student, Paul Pearson further developed the comparative method of the correlation coefficient in order to empirically, le empirically legitimate his eugenic interest in the intellectual superiority of the Aryan race. This has been well documented by many scholars, especially Stephen Jay Gould. The Pearson correlation coefficient is premised on, an, on association or homogeneity via geometric distance from the centroid and multivariate space. This can be simply seen in the estimation of the sum product of the difference of x from the mean of x and the difference of y from the mean of y. The mean of x and y can be, can be better understood as prototypical man for x and y. Um, and the estimated difference is the statistically constructed difference and distance of each sample subject from prototypical man. This produces a comparative method based on sameness and difference. The correlation coefficient also led to further developments of other statistical and psychometric methods, such as regression, principal component analysis, factor analysis, and cluster analysis, among many others. The logistic function was initially developed in the 19th century to study population growth. It found uptake in 1920 when the term logistic was reintroduced by biologist and eugenicist Raymond Pearl and his associate Lowell Reed. Pearl trained in statistics with Carl Pearson, the mathematician and eugenicist, and helped to develop the field of population studies. The logistic curve, aka Pearl curve, was among his major career achievements. For Pearl, the S-shaped curve captured a universal process of growth and the only thing that varied was the intercept, which was based on natural human differences. As Ramsden states, open quote, Pearl's logistic curve represented all that was wrong with the biologist's attempt to study population dynamics, and moreover epitomized the threat of biological imperialism and determinism to social science and social reform, end quote. Pearl's logistic curve was developed into the logistic regression model in the mid 20th century, most notably, by, most notably by Joseph Berkson for bioassay research. Um, Berkson's development of logistic regression from Pearl and Reed's logistic function still made humanist assumptions of the liberal subject. This is specifically materialized in the analysis of a phenomena that is categorized on an ordinal scale, which essentializes human group differences that are further subjected to colonial logics by hierarchizing those differences, i.e. ordinal. As a comparative method of analysis that necessitates identity and difference, logistic regression became one of the main methods for post-colonial analytics of raciality and the pathologizing of difference. 
Logistic regression is what became the statistical foundation to modern measurement theory. Whether it was the Roche model or item response theory, a multivariate logistic regression or LOGIT model was used to advance the field of psychological measurement in the 1960s to the statistical modeling of item and personability parameters simultaneously, accounting for the nonlinear relationship between the continuous scale of personability and the categorical outcomes of item responses. Although postmodern and sociocognitive approaches have been developed with modern measurement theory, it continues to be haunted by its logics of racialism and the scaling of the post-enlightenment subject. And moving to differential calculus. In Ramon Amaro's timely and brilliant dissertation, he traces the racialized logics of colonialism to artificial neural network machine learning algorithms. For Amaro, key to making the connections between the colonial imaginary and machine learning is perception and differential calculus. It is via perception that accounts for the historicity of the epidermalized body and produces the sociogeny of the data. And it is via differential calculus, which undergirds the nonlinear estimation of artificial neural nets, that accounts for the spatial-temporal ordering of bodies, reinforcing the prototypical man in relation to the pathological existence of black bodies. Differential calculus was developed by the philosopher and mathematician um, Gottfried um, yeah, Leibniz. Leibniz sought to develop a method of mathematical reason that would contribute to the estimation of spatial, spatial and temporal ordering of bodies and the legitimation of colonial reason. This is not insignificant because the main terms of modernity and colonial logics of racial hierarchizing were spatiality, including geography, and temporality, including history. More importantly, it is differential calculus that became significant to the developments of neural network machine learning and artificial intelligence. Although Warren McCulloch's and Warren Pitt's cybernetic theory of neural networks was developed in the mid-1940s, um, it was not until the advent of greater computational power and the identifying of differential calculus as a way to advance the computational processing of neural networks in the 1980s that brought about the advancements of neural network machine learning and later deep learning, among others. As a major development, neural network machine learning is used in various algorithmic applications today, including in computational vision, natural language processing, and facial recognition. Thus, Leibniz's interest in the legitimating of colonial reason was accomplished in the take-up of differential calculus in some of the computational methods that are threaded into the quotidian of everyday life. These are just three examples of many other statistical and math mathematical methods that need to be excavated. This is especially important for each of those methods that were developed in relation to the interest and logics of racial capitalism and are underpinned by the modernist terms such as history, time, and space. We also need to be suspicious of axioms of separation or discreteness and to focus on the particular of the local. These additional taken for granted, taken for granted terms of modernity have been the hallmark of discourses on cultural difference, whereby human groups can become essentialized and the, and the global logic of racial capitalism is erased. Each of the above examples demonstrate how in traditional and taken for granted practices of measurement are built on axiomatics of racialism. As I stated before, racialism is a material discursive practice of measurement and measurement is a techno-political process of racialism. As such, measurement has always been part of the socio-political practice of racialism and the techno-political apparatus of racial capitalism. Through this talk, I have sought to provide a broader discussion of the theoretical terrain and challenges that the scholarly discourse on critical theory and quantification seeks to traverse. While the philosophical and theoretical backdrop that I have shared discusses um, the various critical interventions on the instrumental reason of quantification, I argue that this helps to map the terrain of possibility. Post-critical rethinkings and reimaginings of quantification have been in development for at least 20 to 30 years. Some of the earliest have, have come directly out of the critical Marxist tradition 
as well as critical geography studies. This is an approach to critical inquiry that situates and motivates research questions and studies in critical theory, applies traditional positivist methods, and then interprets their results from the critical theory lens. This is especially necessary for work that seeks to engage policy and have an impact on the social and political world. Others works, other works have made similar interventions, including critical race theory, post-structuralism, and post-colonial informed scholarship, while also giving greater attention to the methods, thinking about methods, uh, thinking about methods that may be better suited or aligned with the critiques and presuppositions of respective critical theoretical frameworks, and seeking to proffer a different process of inquiry with quantification that does not fall into the traps of pathology, but rather focuses on making structural critiques. These approaches would include quant crit, indigenous statistics, and participatory action research with, with statistics. Another line of work makes post-critical and post-foundational philosophical interventions. This line of scholarship is influenced by work in new materialisms. French philosopher Gilles Deleuze, as well as Gilbert Simondon and Gabriel Tard, as well as black radical thought. This scholarship the, uh, recognizes the need for theoretical interventions to reconceptualize the ontology, epistemology, and axiology that make up the grounds of quantification. Thus, this line of work has engaged in a philosophical rethinking of the material and discursive formation and practices of number, mathematics, measurement, statistics, and computational cultures. This includes a reconceptualizing of data, a deconstructing of the false dualism between the quantitative and qualitative, and the development of alternative processes of inquiry. This work has also engaged cybernetic and information theory to make interventions in computational cultures. Among this scholarship includes the work of Elizabeth de Freitas, Luciana Parisi, Patti Lather, my own scholarship, among others. This work also draws from affect studies and affect theorists such as Brian Masumi and has even engaged in experiments to examine the visceral and non-conscious bodily responses, movement, and intensities. Each of these approaches of doing the necessary quantitative inquiry with critical scholarship, critical questions, critical theory, address some aspects of various critiques of instrumental reason, though not all. They provide a path toward going after the urging questions of our current global condition of logics of raciality and overdetermined modern worlding. Yet, in order to move beyond the trappings of modernity and colonial reason, what's necessitated, I argue, is a reworking of mathematics and quantification practically anew, in ways that does not assume discrete and separate units, linearity or sequentiality, a movement toward what um, Denise Ferreira da Silva has called difference without separability. Is there a mathematics that assumes an entangled world where entities or existence are not discrete or separate, but inseparable and emergent? Are there forms of measurement, quantification, and computation that can account for non-locality and non-linearity enfolding materialities? I should say, and non-linear enfolding materialities. How might this not only bring about a shift in the axioms in forms of ma mathematics and analyses of quantification, but fundamentally necessitate a radically different ethical political praxis? Where we may find direction may be in the nascent developments of, of um, quantum social science and quantum computing. And I say that quite speculatively. Um, this shift is a necessary one that must be recursively opened to alterity and indeterminacies, the multiplicity and fluidity of onto epistemologies other hyphen wise. This shift must also center the ethics of the other, one that assumes a relationality rather than rationality. Finally, this shift is necessary toward an agonistic movement toward alternative worldings. And I'm stopped there. Thank you. Oh, I missed the slide. All right, thank you.